Okay, uh, today we're going to go over a kind of short slide deck about what race conditions are uh, and how we can avoid them. So we've talked about race conditions a little bit in class so far. Um, hopefully by the end of this you'll be able to give an example of a data race and be able to explain how we can enforce this concept of mutual exclusion that we've hinted at several times in class. So um, a race condition is when two kind of threads, two concurrent operators, two people are trying to perform some operation and uh, it creates what we call a race, meaning that the order that these two participants, these two workers, these two threads perform their work impact the output and can cause it to be incorrect. So, um, you know, those definitions are here. We need to know, we need to be able to define what a race condition is. We need to be able to define what a data race is. A data race, of course, is an example of one of these race conditions. If we have a thread and we are both writing to, we have two threads and we're both writing to the same memory, the order in which that operation happens can change the outcome of the results. So, so here's a quick example that I've drawn up that tries to demonstrate this. Uh, if we have two threads operating on the same variable x, um, then we are in, we are possibly in a race condition. So what can happen is maybe both threads are executing a line of code x plus equals one. Uh, well, when we execute this line of code, what really happens is the value of x, if it's in memory, is read out of memory into a register. Then we increment that register by one. We perform the addition operation. Then we write the value of the register back to x. Um, this is a simplification, but this is the minimum that we need to demonstrate what can happen here. So if thread one performs this operation, reads the register, um, and then at the same time, thread two reads the register, then you may end up with a value uh, five. Thread two will also end up with a value of five. So what may happen is we do uh, an operation such as, you know, five plus one, but thread two also read five. So thread two will also do five plus one, so we'll get six. So both of us achieved the value six, and then we will write this back. Uh, and so the value of x will be six, and we've successfully lost one of these plus ones. It, it was lost, the, the information was lost because we both read the value five. This is a data race. And this is an example of a race condition. And this is an example of where things can go wrong when we do parallel computing if we're not careful. So um, another example, a more in-depth example here um, in real code instead of my paint is uh, perhaps we're operating on a shared variable V. Uh, if all of our threads are writing to V in this case, the exact same thing we just illustrated happens. Uh, instead of getting, you know, um, the full value that we expect to get here, you'll usually end up with something much less because a certain number of your additions will be lost just depending on the order that these um, iterations take place up here and the number of threads you have. It's usually not predictable, but the, the predictability is you will not get the full, um, the full value here unless something on your system is preventing these threads from acting in parallel, which is very rare, uh, very rare case that that would happen. 
you usually have to force that kind of thing. This code is incorrect because it, has, it contains race conditions and it's making use of parallelism. So mutual exclusion, as we've discussed in class, allows us to prevent this. This is the property we want our code to have to prevent a race. So um, what we'll use is a concept called locks. Locks are a programming context. They're a data structure. There are many kinds of locks. Uh, these will basically always be provided to you the same way that threads are provided to you. They go hand in hand. So the most basic kind of uh, mutual exclusion lock is called a mutex. Uh, well, what does mutex mean? Mutual exclusion. It's a type of lock. So uh, we declare a mutex in C++, like with our threading library, we have standard mutex. Uh, this mutex is very simple. Uh, it contains two functions. You can lock it and you can unlock it. Uh, whenever you um, get to this line of code, mute.lock, you will, your thread will try to obtain this lock. We won't go into the implementation details right now, but it will try to obtain this lock. If it can't obtain the lock, it will wait until it can obtain the lock. We'll discuss how that waiting happens uh, in a future lecture, but understand that multiple threads will hit this line and they will pause and one of them will be allowed through to execute this line of code. Then uh, it will execute mute.unlock. Whenever it executes this, uh, that the thread that executes this can continue running and one of the threads that executed or are stuck on this lock operation are allowed through. So this enforces a type of synchronization. All threads that are trying to execute this will be paused and one will be let through at a time. Uh, and this is how we can enable mutual exclusion. We have, in this case, we've ensured mutual exclusion for the access to the variable S, okay? Um, only one person, one thread is allowed to access S at a time because we've used this lock structure. Uh, there are a lot of variants of mutexes that you could use if you are interested. We'll talk about a few more later. Um, and I think that we'll move on from this for now. So in our example that we just looked at, if we used a lock, then all of our threads would be locked here. We've ensured that we have mutual exclusive, mutually exclusive access to v, plot to v, so we can perform our increment operation, and then we will unlock it. Uh, now notice, if we were to add another line for v, maybe outside of this lock unlock, then we've broken our guarantees again, right? Our locks have to be strategically placed to wrap our access to whatever data we're trying to protect, okay? Uh, and in this slide, you can also see an example. To declare one of these, you, you don't have to do anything special. You just create one, uh, we pass a reference to it. No, it's important that it is a reference. We pass a reference to it, to this function, to make sure that we're all using the same mutex and not a copy of this mutex. If you have a copy of this mutex, then all bets are off. It's important that we're accessing the same mutex. Um, there is a, a, uh, a function that you can use, or, a, that called or sorry, a, a data type you can use called lock guard. Lock guard will basically do the mutex locking for you. So if you declare one of these lock guards, uh, to wrap a mutex. So this lock guard LG will wrap our mutex mute. And uh, you'll notice that this happens. We do our plus plus V and then no unlock. That is the purpose of this lock guard is when lock guard LG goes out of scope, uh, it will automatically unlock itself. 
And so the scope here is the inside of this for loop. So we declare it at the beginning of the for loop, increment v, and then we fall out of scope, and so mute is automatically unlocked. This can be very convenient if you have code that has a lot of loops, a lot of if statements, maybe switch statements, different returns, different exits. If you have multiple returns, this can help you make sure that you uh, unlock your mutex and you don't forget a case. Every time you include the word return, you have to have an unlock unless you use a technique like this to do that for you. So this can be convenient, but it's not necessary to use. In this class, uh, we hope you'll use whatever is most convenient for the case that you're trying to use or the, the goal you're trying to achieve. Uh, so a function is called thread safe if it can be called from multiple threads. So this applies to any function, uh, you know, our function f here, uh, we could possibly consider it to be thread safe because you're allowed to call it from multiple threads and as long as you hand it the same mutex or the correct mutex, there is no problem here. Uh, other examples of thread safe are like functional, functional or pure functions like we discussed in class before. Functions that don't have side effects and don't share state, okay? If the only, if the only operation is maybe a return value, you're not editing memory on each thread, uh, that shared memory on each thread, then, then you are thread safe. Uh, likewise, uh, we have uh, the property of reentrance. So a reentrant function uh, is a function that if it gets interrupted, uh, it can be, um, you know, it, it can be interrupted for any of the reasons that we've previously discussed. Uh, and then a different thread executes the same function uh, in the meantime while you've been interrupted. And then you get scheduled again, you can resume without any negative side effects. So um, this is really the same, a very similar definition to what we just discussed. If you don't have any global state, if nothing in the world changes without you, uh, then, then you're reentrant. And this is an important property for doing some, uh, you, know, you know, some compiler actions can take advantage of this. Uh, it's also an important thing for you to understand what, which of your functions are reentrant when you're writing a parallel program if there's a chance that you will be interrupted. Uh, tends to be better to not use global states uh, if you want to avoid unforeseen side effects. Uh, and just as a note, not all library functions are thread safe. Um, you, unfortunately in C++ and C, some of our functions take advantage of global state. Uh, because of that, they're not thread safe. Uh, and they're not, they may not be, or they're not reentrant and they may not be thread safe. So uh, rand, for example, the random function generates a random number. It is not thread safe. There is a reentrant version of rand r. Usually to make something that was not reentrant, reentrant, we have to have some kind of overhead. Maybe we provide additional memory for these functions to operate in, something like this so that we ensure we're not sharing state between each call to the function. And as always, here's a list of references that you can review about these topics if you would like to read more about them. Uh, if you have trouble accessing any of these, feel free to let me know and we'll figure out either how to get you access or an alternative resource. There are plenty of resources.